So, Ichha, do you want to talk about your dissertation work a little bit? Um, yeah, or, or even I think maybe to start from what we were talking about on our way here, um, which is that, you know, this morning when you guys went and knocked on 30 doors and you didn't have a single participant. But, you know, that idea that that is part of, of the field work, right, is that, um, you know, the last study that I had planned, and I go from here and I have this time in the summer and I plan my plan, but then it never works out that way, I always end up extending because then when you actually get there everything changes which is actually that fact itself you might have set up an interview you might have planned something but you go there and you wait the entire day and nobody shows up or that even if they do they just don't not in the mood to have a conversation yeah. or talk and these are not even like um, you know <coughs> cold knocking on doors that they were doing this is like planned in terms of actually people that you know but it's never say oh, I have 15 days or it never turns out to be 15 days it, you know, it ends up being the entire summer and even then even if I get you know one interview and and I guess that also relates to um, conversation that you know Daniel and I had recently about how do you even start an interview right so when do you even begin when you have somebody and you just meet somebody and you know there's idea of trust involved and in you especially if you're talking about sensitive issues um, you know where does it, it, it begin and, and for me what I think has worked is that of course I have my list of questions but I don't you know but it's not my Bible right in, in that sense and it really is something that I have in my head and this is what I want to achieve but then I never let that be sort of you know limit me in any way because sometimes I don't get past the first question and it really it just spirals off to a conversation and, and that for me is partly because I, I am a true believer of listening right? and listening not in the sense of trying to figure out when I can ask the next question but listening to what the person is actually saying and responding to them and the conversation inevitably turns into a different thing that you plan and then you always think oh my god you know I have this many questions or right, what does that happen for for the data because how is that going to fit but I never you know, ever think about those things because everything ha will find its place. Um, it really depends on actually when you come back and you look at it and you think about it and you try to, f you know, make sense of it. And at least for CCA, right, the idea is that you are in a continual conversation with your participants anyway. So it doesn't matter that it didn't go the way I planned. It never goes the way I planned. But having said that, right, I always go with a plan. It doesn't mean I just show up and say, because I like, like today, right, I have no plan. <laughs> and I go, let's talk. But I know, right, because it's something I do. But if this was still, you know, Mohan said, let's go do an interview, right, I would still, all, at that moment, try to right, go in with the plan, which is that, who am I talking to? What am I going to talk about? What is it that I'm going to ask? What is it that I'm trying to find out? But then you go in, and then you talk to the person. And sometimes... It's particularly for women, and especially when I was uh, working with the sex workers, it is that it ends up being my story, right? I have to be the one who sort of initiates that through not a question, but really in terms of my purpose, who I am, or where I come from, and what it is. Um, and you know, right, for, for you guys who have been in the field, that I can wear a traditional clothing and go in there, but it doesn't matter. It is a facade, right? They can see the way I, I talk, the way I, you know, ask questions, the way I am, that I clearly am different. So the question is, do you try to hide that or do you bring that? And I always bring that with me. And this is something that I have learned, I think, through multiple, is that, you know, it, it's, uh, the idea of trust is also transparency. And then if you do, are not transparent in who you are, not only you are, so there's transparency that I tell you what my research objective are, but transparency in terms of who you are, right? And that ties into how you think and the questions and maybe even the re how you respond to the participants. And so, you know, I, so it's like I have a plan, but I really allow each person to drive that conversation and it might be that so sometimes I, I have, but I come out with amazing stories. Um, in the end, because I, I respond, I ask, I talk. I sometimes I just it's just a matter of nodding and, and you know really trying to get them to just say I, I hear you right. And so, it really, I mean it's in some ways it's personality I think right in terms of how we are able to be in the field because it might anger you, it might be really annoying in terms of what they're saying because you you just think it's but then that's not your place. Right? You're not there to, to judge. In fact, you know, they are also judging you. It's just that they don't say it. 
Right? And then, it, their judgment is what builds the trust. It, uh, we are both judging each other. But then the idea is that if you place that judgment and you somehow, and it's sometimes, I didn't say anything, but then think about your body language. I think about your expressions. It all communicates to them whether you are in any way, right, really not feeling what they are saying. Then the conversation is never going to be what you want it to be. So it's one thing in theory, right, but in, in principle to be able to. So I've, you know, so I want to sort of think, oh, next summer I'm going to go and data collect. And I never, I've stopped saying how long I'm going for because I say, okay, I'm going. That's it, right? I go and then. Sometimes it can. I have one interview. Sometimes I have none, and sometimes I have five. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 what I've realized is that at least for interviews, and, and it, sometimes it just takes one person to really believe in you or trust you, and then you start to build a network. Yeah. And it's that. For, and sometimes you're lucky to get that person right at the beginning, and sometimes you've gone through 30 interviews, and you finally find that person who is able to say and attest to you, and then your real your field work really begins in terms of the data that you're looking for, right? But in, but then not to discount everything that has happened, it will have its own place when you do it, but maybe that wasn't what you were um, doing, and there's not a magic number, right? We say s saturation reaches at what, 35 or what, but there's no, no magic. Sometimes it's one and sometimes it's 50. So part of this is the uncertainty in the beginning of field work. Yes. And um, the idea behind that then, what you're capturing, is the notion of labor in field work. You know, when you see a CCA study, uh, you do not see the labor that goes on behind the study in the back rooms and in the back work. And uh, part of that, I think each of what you're capturing uh, is the idea of character. My character as a researcher and your character as a researcher uh, is represented or reflected in this notion of not giving up, right? So. You knock on 30 doors, spend two and a half hours, and you don't get a, a single interview. So what? Big deal. Uh, all that means is that one has to go back in again and knock on 30 more doors. And all those 30 more doors might be unknown. And that means that you go back to the next 30 doors, right? So, uh, and this really ties into the point you are making, Icha, is the unpredictability of the field. This is not uh, a framework where you can say, going in, that, oh, I know, by the time I hit the fifth interview, I have my magic number and my magic rules. But So if I do five interviews, I will hit that jackpot. Because you might not, right? Um, uh, and again, that also ties in with this question uh, of what counts as uh, data saturation. Now, typically we say 35 is where you saturate your data, but that might not uh, be the case, depending upon how the stories emerge. So that too is uncertain in some senses, because your act of being in the story, in the process of co-constructing the story, moves it in particular ways such that that might demonstrate to you spe specific links that you would need to follow. And that might mean that you might need to go beyond any magic number that uh, limits you. So I want to come back to this notion, Icha, um, uh, of labor and uh, labor in the front end uh, amidst uncertainty. Uh, so, for instance, you can have many ways of doing a CCA project. If you have a community partner, the community partner can help you identify. On the other hand, if you start a CCA project as an ethnography, mm -hmm. huh, like we did with the sex worker project, you start with an ethnography of on the streets. Now try imagining uh, talking to sex workers on the street who are actually on the street because they want to make the money. They don't want to talk to you. Even to find that one person might take many hours of being in the field for many days at a go. Yes. So uh, the question then, the impetus then, is not to turn away from that or to turn back from that to the position of privilege that I or you inhabit, but rather to take that as an impulse to keep going back. So that, and that is the key part because I think it's very easy in the front end when you say, okay, I'm not unable to gather the data. Okay, I give up. You know what, this is too difficult, I don't know how to negotiate. And you can make up a bunch of excuses in so your own head. I, I give you an example of the first project I ever 
try to do in the field, right? So um, I thought at that time my IRB also needed to get an IRB in Nepal. So I had an IRB at Purdue, everything is planned out. I went to Nepal. Apparently I didn't need one, but I you know, went to all these places to figure out to get an IRB. Spent most of my summer trying to do that. Finally got my, you know, uh, this institution to get an IRB to be able to, but it, it, it wasn't really linked to the, the field. It's just that I don't know why I had the impression that I had to have IRB from two places to be able to do this. So this, I was on this, this, you know, thing of getting an IRB. So I go to the field, which is a community. Um, you know, a squatter community. So they've just kind of sprung up, right? And so imagine you just walk in and you're trying to get them to, to talk to you and to, you know, you have your list of questions. And I'm so thrilled because I finally got my running around chasing my IRB. But, you know, and then by that time, I'm, I'm there for a limited time in the summer. My summer has already been cut in half. I only have this much time, and then I go into the community, I observe, I talk to people, but it's very surface. Right? There isn't anybody who's in there. They're happy to show the, what, the schools that they're building in there, the access they have, but nobody really wants to talk about them. Um, and I make all these observations, I write, write all of these things, but I still have nothing. Um, and so you think, oh my God, right? I, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving soon. Do I extend it? Do I do what? And then you know, f I guess it's different here because you you start with an objective. But for me, that was a, the first learning experience of really knowing myself in terms of how I am when I go into the field, and perhaps the perceptions I also present. But also the fact that you know you go through all of this trouble, and I have nothing to show for it. And in the end, I have no study, no publication, nothing. That that was just is okay. what it is and I, you know, I see it and I have it in my, in my file but that's, that's all it was, it's become a, a file, a letter that says I have this IRB approval to and from two countries, right, from two places to say I can do, but it didn't matter, right, when I went to the community, they were so happy, I mean they talked about things, right, but it wasn't really in terms of health, it wasn't really in terms of, and you can see because it's a squatter community that how they have built, and they're happy to bring you to their house and show you how they're living, again, but it's, it's, it's Nothing in terms of what that means to them, how they manage that, what it is. And the only thing I got a lesson from that is is really this idea of, at that time we were thinking okay. about family planning or reproductive okay. health. And this guy looked up the billboard and okay. he said, look at where I live and what I have to do and look at that. Am I going to pay it? And there was this big sign about family planning and whatever else. And I said, you tell me. Right? And then why I would you know pay attention when, when I'm thinking about sending my child or what do you see where I'm living and what this is important in terms of you know there's no water there I have to think why do I pay attention to that right and so that was really my first experience in terms of the fact that okay and, and not to mention that if you talk about mess in terms of literal mess right and think about where I'm living and I'm in a community which is dusty it's dirty I'm sitting on the floor if you think about my clothes I mean you know like it really is literally being in the mud, in that sense, right? Being, being part of that and eating what they're eating and doing. But if you think about it from my, who I am, and I, that's not how I live and eat. But really, that I think is also swallowing your pride in some sense, right? And, and really being part of that environment in that sense. And the only reason that they were even willing to talk to me that much was because I was willing to be part of that environment and not sort of distance myself in a way that I look at it, you know, and sort of from the top and say, oh, I don't know if I sit here and, right, if, well, is that clean? And, but they're boiling and they're eating, the, you know, it's the pot is what it is, it's there. If you open up that space, you accept it and you think, am I going to get a some stomach aid? And we, we go around teaching about sanitation and here I, you know, I mean, if I start doing those things, then what's the point? They're there, you're never going to build that trust, right? If this was my dissertation, of course, you know, I, for my dissertation, I spent like seven months, I would different environment going back you start that's the point you start to build that right what I missed out in is was I was starting to build that kind of a um, relate every day going back and doing that you know doing that 15 days and I still have nothing right but then at that time I'm leaving and so I have not but then it gave me a different kind of a lesson I have no publication but it's okay but it made sort of shaped my Self in a way that when I was planning for my dissertation, I was able to think of it in different ways, and to really plan it in in a way that really accounts for some of those things that you, you know, that nobody tells you about or you don't think about until you put in that place and you realize, oh my God, and this is this is. So part of this is I think when you think about the front end of a culture centered work, um, sort of figuring out whether you have it 
in you to do it or not. Yeah. Right? Because uh, if you don't want to get messy, you might as well go and do a few surveys or you might you have tons of secondary data. Go, nobody is stopping you from going out and analyzing that and publishing your studies. I and think that that's very different kind of mentality, attitude, character as Rati would put it. You know, she has said that you have to have a particular kind of yeah. character to want to do CCA. And I think part of that character is uh, the desire to go back into the field in the midst of messiness. Um, and swallow your, right? Like, swallow your own pride, I think, in some ways. Right? Because it does, I mean, I could have like, really said that is a failure and I have nothing and come back to... Or Vermont. you could have, even better, you could have turned to the community and said, ah, this community, you yeah. know, they don't useless, uh, respond pointless. to me, they are useless, they are on, you know, yeah. government subsidies and Very funding. Ignorant. And But people do that, yeah. you know, we, uh, we, it is us we do that, we have that within our personalities to do that. And that can be a very easy way to turn away from the field. Yeah. I think, right, when I came back and I had only my reflections to give to, yes. to Mohan. And I, I said, said okay. that is okay, yeah, right? It's okay, fine, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, that's what I said, okay. What but the point was, point was what? That you tried, right. that you kept knocking at it. Right, we can easily say it's a failure, but then it, it depends on what you set up to do, right? It's really is ultimately all about the, the public. Yes, our life depends on it, but if that's all it is meant to do, then... It's really... And I mean, I will share this example, right, Itcha? Like today as we were sharing this story of knocking on 30 doors, and somebody said, but I wouldn't want to do that because you didn't even get... I would at least want a few uh, positive interviews out of that. But that's the point. You cannot control that when you do this. You cannot control that if you go and knock on 30 doors and you're going to hit five. And if you uh, pitch yourself to saying that, okay, my success or failure depends upon whether I am able to get what five out of thirty is what one sixth. So that is sixteen percent turnover rate, uh, positive turnout rate. That is very limiting, right? I mean, I, qualitative is already challenging, but then you throw CCA in there; it's like you know, double whammy in terms of. of the notion of messiness, I mean, I think it takes it even further because it's, uh, you know, needs, it's going further than just collecting the data, right? So there is this idea of maybe resistance also and in many levels of, um, you know, it's not like just somebody coming in and going in. But at the same time, you know, if you go to a community that has been exploited where they just get data and you leave and then... You, they wouldn't want to be And so then you want, to, you want to work with them and you say, what well, we're different, right? I mean... Do you shy away from them, and or you say, okay, but they they've had this, and they don't understand. So we'll go to a fresh community, right? I mean, if the purpose is really it's if that community and has to be done, and they're resistive, then it takes that much longer. But then, right, that's part of the deal, and you have to do that in order to really be able to then get to what you want to do. And those are things that you can never plan for. Even you can have you know brainstorming session for months, and you exactly. plan you, when you go there. It's like. You, you only know when you get there. So that's the, but if you, then again, if you don't go with the plan, then you, you'll be all over the place and it makes no sense either. So you have to have a plan, but, but also be allowing willing to, for the, yes, right? let that plan go out the window. Yeah. Sathvi, you were going to say something? Yeah, I just, just want to know your personal experience based on your research. At which point um, do you jeopardize your own personal safety? when engaging with a particular community, especially with subjects that are pretty, uh, where you know you're engaging with that with an environment that might not see your privilege as something they want to be part of. At which point would you jeopardize your personal safety? I think maybe an example that might relate is your project with the Assamese fighters, if I'm not wrong. The, at, at which point did you decide that this was worth it or not worth it in terms of your, in terms of, as, as a scholar? Because I feel like if, but this is a question I'm asking simply because the project that I'm thinking about for my PhD would mean that I would be going to an environment where I might not, I might be putting my personal safety at jeopardy. So I, where, at which point would you draw this line? I haven't been in that kind of a, a situation, but if it was me, right, there you can assume in, in terms of the community that there is 
maybe you know a, a issue of safety but it's also again hard to know until you study the community right and until, you, until you're there. you understand that and until you go there and you can only then assess for yourself to what level you're comfortable and if you are not comfortable nobody is going to say you must yes. complete this right if there is an issue where you feel like this cannot happen and this is going back to that idea of uncertainty also but because for all of us there's probably a different level of tolerance and different level of what we are comfortable with so even if you think this community might be so you that means you go in prepared but until you go there and you have a conversation you kind of see what is happening it's hard to to have a definite answer of what what to do right because then you would know yourself what needs to be done because you see it and you know whether you're able to cope with it manage it as a way around it or is it just like oh my god you know i really feel like i cannot you know do this so we should take the first step with at least trying to engage with the community and and so part of this satveer is that you don't know it till you're there mm. and when that decision of and that goes with most other things in our lives right mm. when that situation of safety or lack thereof arises that's when you negotiate at that point at that moment what you do whether you want to carry on or whether you pick a particular course you know but i i think at the same time too right there's one thing about being aware but there's another thing about letting it cripple you in the sense that you are always in fear that something's going to happen then it's like being you know if you imagine if you live your life being paranoid all the time there's always something something that's going to i mean i mean there, come right? to think so of it like you know we there are many cc projects my santali work is a good example of work that is done in the midst of a lot of threat a uh, lot of physical threat um if you think about mohuas work with the farmers in singur you know where the farmers were organizing it was done amidst threat because there was uh, police violence there was farmer resistance if you think about indux yes. work with the uh, farmer activists in south korea again there was threat because she was working with the activists activists were being taken and put to jail but for none of us uh, uh threat works as a concept out there threat is real as it is lived in the field and then of course that doesn't mean that we are oblivious to that threat but the rather the question is once we are in the field in that setting and the threat becomes real what we choose to do with it so just as you talk about you know my presence in a community where there are uh, threats to health or threats to life i can at the same time tell you that between 2008 and 2011 when there was large scale maoist violence and it had taken uh, very large scale where there were curfews and all that i did not go into that same community uh when i went back in 2011 and started initiating the contacts um uh, it was after assessing again uh, the extent to which i could be physically there in the community by being present so all of this is to say that you negotiate that but the negotiation again has to happen where in the field in the experience you cannot so i even i cannot sit here and draw out a map and do a risk assessment of what is the potential likelihood of violence in punjab now so part of that is that uh, by being present in that setting then you are able to make that assessment but i i will tell you one thing the from my experience that whatever we we think it might be internal to us in terms of our feelings when we go into the community we think it's just us but I mean, people are not stupid then we that's the whole point right of doing cc is also that it does it's not yes you know education gives you access and you have maybe you become more cynical in life and whatever else but then, but the idea is that you know it doesn't mean that people who are living their life are also not able to understand something so if you have you have this you know you go let's say for example into the community with this idea that there's fear and there's a violence and that you are and you will you know exhibit those unconsciously even if you don't say it in terms of your manner in terms of the way you interact and people pick up on that and it's like a a cycle right sometimes you kind of bring that because people also read into that so it's this idea of really being able to be mindful of yourself to the way that you kind of can let go and and really assess it as it is that really that if there is an idea there's threat there's violence there's secure, it is because it's there and it's real it's not imagined or felt because yes. you have read or, about or, it or mediatized through some other kind yes. of narratives yes. 
And so it's true for any kind of, of setting is that you allow that to be because of that, in, in that sense, and whatever whatever it is that you are, you know, whatever kind of sex, even if it's migrant workers, it doesn't, right? And, and, um, so because in different set settings, different sense of insecurity and, and is there, right? and threat and violence in different forms. It doesn't always mean that it has to be a physical kind of a violence, right? That violence could be in, in different ways where you just feel uncomfortable all the time in, in who you're working with, that it gives you a sense of really not being able to let your guard down to, and that's the, the point, right? Is that if you cannot let your guard down, you also will not be able to move past that initial, um, you know, just talk about this and that and really not be able to move uh, into the project. But if you that stays with you, that also is an indication that really maybe you need to assess being there. In that and you know, the other part of that is, uh, right, if there is violence, to what extent, when you find violence, to what extent do you romanticize that? You know, and, and part of that beingness is noticing the violence as is, as it is at that moment, and seeing if you engage with it, if you can engage with it, if you have the capacity to engage with it in a meaningful way, and then finding a course of action. So, um, in that sense, uh, uh, to the extent that we script that violence into romantic scripts, that again also fits into uh, portrayals of that particular community in ways that delegitimize the community and the voice of uh, community members. The other thing I was going to say, Chad, in that sense, then when you talk about messiness and uncertainty and being in the field, it seems like in most of culture-centered work, it is the field that occupies, takes up the space. You see, so uh, when I envision a culture-centered project, or a center to do culture-centered work, it is the field that I envision should be at the center, and it should all be about the field. In that sense, unfortunately, in communication, uh, we are not trained into ethnography, right? But our life should be one of ethnographers, in a sense that when we think about theoretical questions, when we think about how to resolve theoretical issues, uh, those kinds of resolutions should come through the field, through experiences in the field. So when we talk, each and I spend a lot of time talking to each other. When we talk to each other, it is our field, each of our field sides that take up our conversations, that take up our collaborations. Hmm? And that's why we continue to collaborate after you know, so many years, the same with Ambar, because it is the field that brings us together and connects us. It is not reading some exotic text. And in that sense, I think maybe it's different in the lab, right, because you are doing, the, I don't know, I mean, maybe it isn't so different, is that we also have our own take or interpretation of CCA, right? And this is why we have a continued conversation because sometimes, you know, I, I go in and say, but, right, this is how I see and this is what I do and how is it, right? And and so this is this idea that it is not a formula that we can, yes. can and, and But apply. that is driven by field again, yeah. right? When you bring that and you say, this is what I'm seeing in the field and it isn't quite, you know, holding. And then we can talk about, okay, these maybe are the boundary conditions. But you're right. So in th that case then, it is not a prescription, right? It isn't uh, a, a cookie cutter model where you say, oh, I do 20, like how our undergrad students want, right? Like with the thesis, oh, I do 20 interviews, 30 minutes to 40 minutes, I'm done, voila, I have a CCA project. No. Yeah, sometimes it's 10 minutes interview and sometimes it's two hours, right? It just... And not only in terms of the time, but I think also. And so when people ask me about CC, I say, well, this is my take. This is my interpretation, and this is how I do it, and this is how I see it, because this is how I apply it in, in that sense. So I have a question. I mean, this is what I found with the women farmers. So when the first time I went to talk to them, they'll give very brief answers, and the interview will be over in 10, yes. 5 to 10 minutes, right. because yes. they know you're, they think that you are here for just, you know, kind of vacation Certain or answers, something. Yes. So, yeah, but. If you've seen more often in 
participating in their programs and going along with them. Uh, then they, the next time they have more trust and are willing to sit with you for longer periods of time and talk their stories. So it's, it's, it's also like staying there and being visible uh, and being part of the field that you're here for more amount of time. You're not just like and a And it's a long-term commitment. Yeah, that, I think that, that kind of builds a trust. And do you find the same thing that, you know, earlier on they are just very quick answers and they always come up with ex some excuses. I mean, I'll give programs. you an example, JT. What does health mean to you? Mm -hmm. You will get really cryptic responses, exactly, or, yeah. but but even with that question, uh, my presence in the field over a long period of time will open up different kinds of conversational threads. Mm -hmm. With that same, same question, question yeah. what does health mean to you? And, and does that mean that oh we should uh, not ask that question? Uh, if you if you base it on the basis of the first few times you go out into the field and ask that question you might have a very different experience, then your engagement with that question at a different time, at a different level of presence in the field. And, and so this is what I mean by my take or interpretation, right? Because when you can translate that and you ask it in Nepali, it's like, what, what in the world are you asking me, right? So I break it down in different ways and have different conversations. And sometimes it could be just like, you know, I, I'm feeling this way today and, and I, you know, I, I just came back and I've been here for a week and I, you know, and so sometimes it's just, oh, you know, and then starts a conversation about your health in, in a way that, really, oh, I, you know, this, uh, they give you advice, especially if they're older women, they tell, you know, give you advice and eat this, eat that. And so kind of rolls that yeah. and I get to that point without really, because if I walk in and I say, so, and they just look at me like, where, the, where did you drop <laughs> <Yes>. from? <Right? laughs> and, and so, so sometimes it could be that that is all I want to know. But that could be probably comes an hour later yes. after we've talked about everything under and framed in a very different sun, way. And framed in a different, a different way. So you know, it never. You know, I said this is the way it must be. That um, I don't know. I, I don't know if your other advice ever did that, but I guess I was ever yes. one to <laughs> follow directions. So it worked perfectly for me because I, you know, I never follow directions or anything in, in life. So. I kind of bend it in the way it kind of I, uh, it the way fits I, I fits that my context. personality and the way I think. So, and so for me, it you know it tends to work. So I don't think I ever um, have asked that question. But that's what we're trying to get at in many way, places, right? But yeah, I also also notice that that's, uh, uh, what you mean by health uh, or what is the meaning of health? How do you define health? These questions are uh, usually uh, met with uh, black faces or, you know, kind of like uh, they can directly tell you that I'm confused. And usually the everyday version of it becomes that uh, how do you keep your family members yes. healthy? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and then they start to talk about all kinds of different right. stories. Yes. And then medicine is, uh, to me also means, I mean, uh, when Dr. Dola and uh, Icha talks about this, uh, you know, after long years of collaboration, still talk about the uh, uh, empirical richness of uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, ethnographic research. I mean, medicines in that sense also translates into a plethora or of knowledge or richness of information. That is, yeah, really the uh, attraction of ethnographic work. Yeah. But I think just uh, a few weeks ago, I think it was in. <laughs> office and we were talking about right so you see it and kind of the 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 maturity or the, the changes it has gone through since the time I used it for my dissertation to what you guys are doing and my impressions and kind of that and then you know and, and of course you can get him heated up pretty quickly <laughs> of CCA and but Icha, you know? And so, but then that's what kind of gets, you know, and so, but Mohan, right? And then it's kind of, yes. but you know, that kind of a, it's not like because this is, you know, but I have a different interpretation of it because I was at a different time when we were thinking about CCA. So I look at it quite differently and then say somebody else who does it. So it's like, you know, and then you actually, if you read each other's papers on different phases, we, you see those reflections in how we actually make those yes. things. But in terms of, you know, our own growth too, we, we take that from that point and then probably, um, you know, so people who are always in the field for CCA have a very different understanding for the projects that you might end up running than where I began with when we were just talking about CCA in a, in a sort of a different you know, classroom and thinking about how you, you were thinking about growing it in a different ways and really um, 
the tensions of, of CC and working that, right? So different, and so even if we have a conversation, we will have a different conversation because we have different um, understandings of it in, in many ways. And, and part of that, Icha, when we were talking about that, it was also identifying the boundary conditions. And I think any kind of approach or framework should have boundary conditions, meaning that everything in life cannot be studied from CCA. So uh, I don't think we should try to fit every, anything that we look at from a CCA uh, framework. Uh, so it's important to identify what those boundary conditions are, where a theory does not hold true, or where uh, the theory might not apply. Or, or with your own sense of... Right, in terms of, um, and I think I've, you know, because I've known Daniel the longest and had this conversation multiple times and refer back to our other conversation about my interpretation of CCA being a, uh, a methodology, being an approach, being a theoretical framework, a, a different ways of actually using it. And in terms so of... So you have to define clearly yes. when you're doing it, how you're taking CCA and how you're applying it. So be not, and that's not just for writing... Uh, the papers, that comes a lot later, but even when you're starting, are you taking the culture structure agency part of it and that's what you're going to focus on? Or are you going to focus on the subordinate studies aspect of it in terms of co-constructing with erased voices? Or are you going to treat it as a methodology in terms of reflexivity and working through reflexivity with participatory processes? Right? Or you, are you going to develop an application out of it? Voices, right? Sometimes it's just that you just want stories. Nothing it has nothing to do other than really using a cultural framework to get to those stories. And it could be all of it. It could be all. It of could it. be all of it. Yeah. Of course, it could. And it often is in projects that are over that happen over very long uh, yes. courses of time. So Ambar's project with sex workers, I think, it's 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 it's, it's pretty comprehensive. You know, in a sense that it is all, 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 all of it, because the method constantly keeps pushing theory. But I think this part is really important when we talk about these issues of transparency, negotiating trust, uncertainty. A being the part about dissing the people that you interview. That does tend to happen. You know, when you bring in your own lens and you look down upon the person that you're interviewing. So I, when you do that, <coughs> be mindful of it. You know, rather than being defensive, A, be mindful of it. B, let that work on you. Mm -hmm. What does it say about you when you judge someone? What does it say about your own lenses, perhaps about your own privilege? That's very powerful when that happens because then that's telling you something about your own, that tells me something. When I find myself doing that, that's a very powerful moment and it's important for me to jot that down because that is like an aha moment. Or Abit, for you, for instance, when you're going and documenting uh, the migrant workers, when you're referring to them as them, right? that is a point of privilege. Be mindful of that. What does it mean when, for instance, they become them and you become the savior? Right, that through your lens you are saving them. That is a privilege. Be mindful of that and then let that work on you. Or when you are doing these interviews with healthcare access, if you uh, come in there and think, okay, you know, these people are talking about access, they seem to have a lot of access uh, and yet they seem to be really. Uh, you know, like the welfare mom typology, right? That they are, are lazy bags. Using you know, they are using the system. Okay, if you have noted that, be mindful of it. Mm -hmm. Then work on it. What does that say about you? Because that, into that script then, when you have responded like that, what it is bringing out is a history that locates you vis-a-vis -vis the person you just interviewed. What became aware within that short moment is a history that you inherit that has made you who you are and made that person who they are. So I tell you, I had a conversation today about right, my, my 
one of my projects and talking about stories of, of women and so the person said, do you go in with all your research questions? I mean, your interview, guy. yes I do. Do you ask that question to everybody? I said, not sometimes, but then how do you get consistency across the stories? And I went, uh-huh. <laughs> what, uh, what consistency? That's the whole point. Sometimes, you know, and so I didn't say anything, but that is a certain kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Right? In terms of what you're looking for, that idea that you have is... And I was like, yeah, but that's not the point. That's what I'm trying to tell you is, is what But I'm these are from doing, people right? that think they know CCA. But see, that's the other part. So, uh, you see, and that's the desire to turn CCA into a script. Right? Where it's a scripted set of methods. Mm -hmm. Somehow people think that, okay, Mohan, can you give me a, a cheat sheet with steps, procedures, protocols, questions, I will take this and replicate it. But the point is you can't, because as Rati says, it's part of your character. So I guess the question Rati puts it is that either you can or you cannot do CCA. If you cannot build your character to be that, you cannot do this method. And I, I think that's pretty uh, discriminatory in some senses, because it rules out a bunch of people saying that you, you are not capable of doing CCA. But I think that's pretty powerful, because it is saying that this is about a mind frame, an attitude, a philosophy, a way of being methodologically as a researcher. But it's, uh, now I can get into the conversation, uh, in the sense that there can be consistency because they are uh, sharing the same kind of space. So, for example, with the women farmers, like their consistency about what constitutes health for them. And I guess... I mean, but you're not asking the same question. Right. right. You might not, you're not yeah. about asking the same set of questions to Every you, single woman. Uh, Pauline. Right, okay. But they can be consistent. Yes, yes. So consistency through, comes out through the narratives narr because right. of, of what is happening in the discussion, not because I'm asking each person the same, same questions. questions. Right, right. And making sure so I ask the question. So it is not a frame so can, that is pushed yes. on to them. Yes. Yeah, but it's a frame that emerges. Yeah. Right. But also part of this is, so when we have a protocol, yeah, we do have a protocol. But right, when you have seen me in action in the field, mm -hmm. the, we, do we stick to the protocol? No. we go on from the responses. It's yes. more like exactly. based on what are the Rather than, okay, that's done, and next, what's the next question on my sheet? So I have some other question, but I can hold on if other people have Can't even Questions. Um, about, um, yeah, I'm th thinking that in terms of uh, not only uh, not looking for, or maybe sometimes do look for consistency, we are actually also telling this story of the field. But then, um, at moment of contradictions, uh, contradictory uh, storytelling, or even the same person contradicting himself mm -hmm. at the end of the conversation versus at the beginning of the conversation, we need to also ask a question of why, in what context is he doing that. For example, I have the, this field uh, experience that uh, from the very beginning when I asked about this health and care and then he talked about this uh, care as part of the uh, you know the Chinese traditional value does not exist anymore so he referred to uh, um, filial piety he said that uh, okay it as a um, moral standards is um, dwindling but then later on another person asked him about uh, you know uh, I don't think so uh, Filial piety is still the uh, you know Chinese uh, traditional uh, culture, and uh, the, it's the very essence of it. And then he comes back to say that okay, yeah, it is still it is still very prominent in our village. So so actually, this guy, the same guy, has uh, two different kinds of account of filial piety. And then later on, when I analyzed this data, I realized that uh, actually the first one when he was referring that uh, the moral standards was uh, in the dwindling, he was actually referring to you know, this large structural level that when his two sons went to the cities to work, and then he's thinking about his future, that his sons are not going to you know, mm. pay the same kind of uh, filial duties to him. But then when that same peer is talking about that, they are referring to their actions towards their parents. So back to the village uh, practices that actually it exists and it's 
actually our village is doing the exemplary work. So these are very different frames. Yeah, very different frames, but you same know, issue. Yeah, same issue, and then they happen in a sense that these frames do not manifest themselves, and you have to figure this out sometimes by directly asking them. So I find that uh, fascinating, because that uh, yeah, when you find contradictions think about it and uh, it can be emerging place of new knowledge. That's my take. <laughs> so one of the things that I have found, Kang, uh -huh. is that interviews can be very different. Interview A can be different from B, can be very different from C, right? Yes. So some interviews can be really fluid, that can flow and the story can build. And some interviews, mm, you're struggling to even get some words out. Mm -hmm. just, I even yeah. But uh, that is part of the field. Yeah. That is part of the experience in the field. But the question is, what do you take away from that? Right? Do I watch JT do that and see JT do a really fluid interview? And they say, oh, you know, JT had a good uh, time because it was an easy interview this person was really talkative. Mm -hmm. Or uh, do I uh, uh, take a lesson from that in terms of this idea that how interviews flow can depend upon the trajectory and how you are into it or one with it, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And, and what that means is that I might have an inter a good day where an interview is really fluid and it really builds mm -hmm. and I might have a really bad day or two interviews back to back yes. might be that different. While the yeah, second exactly. interview, ah, the person isn't really talking, they aren't really sharing, mm -hmm. they aren't really saying things. But that too also is a reflective moment. Yes. Uh, also happens that uh, after the interview you can be really depressed and then you feel that you have a bad day, but then later on you reflect on this, you have some uh, real findings. For example, when I was talking about this healthcare issue, and then they it's a, it's a large group meeting. And then they talked about this farm uh, work. And then they referred to this apple orchard because that, that village is, uh, you know, that it's, each family has an uh, apple orchard. But then I was, uh, I just asked them, you know, uh, when, when it's the flowering, the b blossom uh, uh, season, then uh, you just uh, you you do do nothing. You you just uh, go there and then uh, you know uh, observe their beautiful sceneries. And then they talk to, to me like uh, you know from it's almost like a farm uh, orchard farming one or one or something. That they say that each flower you know it's a cluster of flowers of seven. And then you have to pick all the rest of the six and only let one remain. So basically, that they do this repeated work for one tree, it can be like uh, several hours. And then in the end, you, they will say that it's aching all over. And then in that way, they explained it to me. And then because that's the village where I grew up, so one member of the f extended family talked to me <laughs> directly saying that, oh, it's so hard to talk with you about our farmland. Meaning that you are, you know, offspring from this same village and you are asking these stupid questions yeah. and you are like a cultural tank coat. And then it's like a before in front of like 17 people. And I, I felt this, you know, so I blushed and then I felt that so embarrassed. But later on when I looked at, I looked at this kind of uh, this uh, part of data, I was thinking that how about, you know, does it say something true about everyone who goes to college after being living in a village for a long time? Does that also say something about these peasant workers who go to their cities at a fairly young age and stay in the uh, cities for 10 years? without coming back to even observe the uh, their so, apple flowers uh, in blossom or let alone to help pick the flowers. Yeah, so it becomes a part of the experience of this uh, elder generation. Yeah, the similar experience. The women farmer, I was trying to explain that I'm not a doctor of health, neither am I a doctor of animals, 
Mm -hmm. uh, she was saying, oh, that's so sad. At least if you have learned some agriculture, you would have been able to survive. And she was making fun of, you know, that my knowledge is nothing in the agriculture field. Uh -huh. You know, Icha said something, I really thought that was so interesting. When you said how your interview plays out is also a reflection of what you bring to the table, right? So if you are judging, the person that you are interviewing will be able to tell. You know, if you are looking at them condescendingly, trust me, they will be able to tell. Mm -hmm. So part of this also is when we say, you know, reflect on your own attitudes, I need to reflect on mine, Icha needs to reflect on hers. Right? Part of this is recognizing when you do that and also recognizing that that actually plays out in how you do the interview and what comes out in the interview. Yes. Have you seen that happen? Yeah, right. You know, I remember Nadine yeah. used to do this because Nadine's project was with this uh, social welfare program, Women and Children. As you know, in America, uh, the narrative on welfare moms is a pre predominant narrative that uh, they are immoral, uh, they are not hardworking, they are not committed to the family, they keep on having babies so that they can be on welfare. So Nadine told me at one time, so she would go out and do these interviews, and we used to do this often, right? And she would come back and we would have a long conversation about, you know, what her field experience was like. And she was like, Mohan, I just can't help but judge some of these women. Because I'm thinking, you know, you have four kids, you cannot take care of them, you're on welfare, how come you're pregnant again? And she, she was like, I can't help but judge them. And so part of her working through that was working through this idea that she, her tendency was one to judge them, not understanding their rationality as to how they could want to have a fifth kid and be pregnant with the fifth kid when they are struggling to manage with four kids. Yeah, it, does make, it really makes a difference. Because it also changes not only your you know, body language and expressions, but your tone, the way you ask the question, how involved you get with them, how you hold back, right? I mean, it, all of those plays out. And, and when you can interact freely and openly is when you get the, the response, aside from the fact that they've seen you multiple times and they say, okay, this person is not so bad and I can have a conversation. But then they start having a conversation and they feel like you really are there just, you know, you, you really, is, in some ways, uh, confirm their suspicion of you, right, in, in that way, because you haven't managed to kind of move yourself past that uh, boundary. So, so during the interviewing, you have, one has to let go of having control over the, yes. on the interview yes. process. And your own reaction, right? Sometimes, so, like in yeah. terms of the fact that you might, so, and it's not to say, and Mohan might like hit me over the head with this, but this, that just because it's CCA doesn't mean you cannot get angry and upset and, I agree. and, and, and really be like, oh, you know, just, uh, but then it's not your place, right? Then that's right. part of the reflection is for you to come back and say, why is it that just got me so right. like, upset about this? And then reflect this, on that emotion. Upset about yeah. this. Is there something in it that really is, you know, needs to be, and then maybe, and sometimes, you know, you might go back and really try to figure that with the next interview, who interviewee who might have no inclination whatsoever of what you're trying to get, but you're trying to figure out that tension or what is it that that's have is it something that's across the board? Is it one person? Is it what is it that gets you um, in that sense? But it's not to say at the moment, you know, um, you know. But I think sometimes, and I have done this, right? Sometimes you say, really? I mean, how is it? Why? And I kind of show yes. that, right? And say, not that I'm judging them, but like, can you just help me understand? Yes, I can't understand. I, I, can't I, just, I yes. cannot picture it. I cannot understand it. Yes. Can you tell me, help me understand right. your position or your situation? It's not that I'm saying, oh my God, you just stupid, right? And then it's like, just but more like, okay, I might be feeling that, but I'm trying to still kind of not be that, right? And say, just help me understand what it is that you are thinking, doing, saying, feeling, what is it that makes you, drives you to to do this as opposed to that or whatever it is, so you try to get to that question as opposed to, you know, feeling frustrated and, because if we feel frustrated then we kind of move back to asking questions and really understanding what might be going on. And so, you know, I, I, for sure, <laughs> do get, um, in that, but then you know, I do channel it in a different way in terms of, of what that does for me.
Yeah, it's just a, I'm sorry, this is very exciting, but uh, I have an appointment, like uh, I need to get ready. You have an appointment too, right? So one uh, quick question, so how do you manage this messiness with the uh, sort of the policies out here that you can only spend certain time, some certain amount of time in the field? Did you, I mean, do you have that problem back when you're doing your? Let me say that again. Uh, I mean, there are only certain days you can be away in the field, and then. Yeah, but she had even lesser. Oh, okay. You get ninety days. Yeah. We <laughs> get much lesser than that, right? So, how are you saying how do I manage my time if I only have yes. ninety days? That's right. To be able to get be the, in the field. Yeah, be the field. Get to know the people and do the interviews. I know it's right. Sometimes it's not about how much time you spent. It sometimes really is about meeting that right person in that field who allows you to kind of becomes your advocate or get, helps you network and if you need that one person to say, hey, it's okay, you know, kind of open that up. And um, and sometimes then you wait and wait and it happens on the 15th day and you're leaving and, and as I was saying, like then I you saw, come back. And then you come back or you extend and you sometimes, that's what I say, I, now I don't say how long, it is, I just say I'm going. Right? Um, because. It really, I don't. Need so I think part of that, JT, and we kind of figured it out, is to do it in chunks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do it in 10, 15 days, you give it your best, try to do as much, then come back, come back right. again, you because know. Because that also shows and that, go back you, again. Right, yeah. that you are interested, that you're committed, committed. that you're coming yeah, back. Yeah. And so sometimes this is what I suggest for my you know, PhD student who's thinking about a two year kind of extended. Um, in the field is keep going back. Yeah. Don't say I'm going to go and stay in the field. It's, be realistic, right? Yeah. First of all, your life you cannot put on hold uh, for two years, but then it's no longer, you know, mm -hmm. anthropology, ethnography like it happened in two years, you know, where you actually go and live in a mountain top for two years <laughs> or whatever, right? It's, you cannot. But then it also shows your commitment because you keep coming back, you keep right. yeah. doing right. that. So it's like, you know, uh, for, for like CCA project that you want to build over long term, I would suggest that. For me, it, you know, I haven't really planned anything for a year or two years. It really is in small um, pieces, so it's easier to do that. Mm -hmm. But I really, but then that also sets the tone for the next project or whether you can build something from there. And for me, really, that was sort of the way into the next project that I'm thinking about, right? So sometimes it serves a different um, purpose as to why you might just. And the setting can be very it different, is. right? So when we are doing projects in Singapore, mm -hmm. that setting is very different as opposed to when we are doing projects in India. Right. So for thinking about projects in India, you have to ration it that way and also hopefully find a local research partner. Mm -hmm. You know, so like for instance with uh, my project in Bengal and that has taken so many routes, I'm able to go, thankfully being in Singapore, I'm able to go every three, four months for ten days, mm -hmm. you know, and then maybe for a month in summer. Okay. Um, but then I have local researchers who are there in that field site constantly all the time. So with the women farmers, if you have a women farmer Who's who is, comes on as a co-researcher, mm -hmm. that increases their presence also. Yeah. That's a, that's a but I, I, this is idea of knowing yourself and knowing the field too. I mean even before I, I met Mohan, my first field experience was I had was doing a in summer internship for an organization in, in Nepal, right? And so they were going into the field. And then they only told me this afterwards. The team, they were like, "Oh, there's this kid, right, who comes from the US, wants to go in the field." And they're like, "Everybody's like, okay, we don't really want to deal with this person, right?" And then, right, when I was in the field, I was in the field. I ate, or within I slept, and sometimes I just had to swallow and close my eyes, and you know, really close my eyes until I couldn't, you know, and because it's it's hard to sometimes adjust to to the environment in in some ways. But really, right, being in that moment just kind of. In, in not to say say I'm being a different person or to differentiate from where I'm, but to really live in that place in, in the sense of what is going on. So that later on they're like, oh, I'm so surprised that actually you you can do this, right? You you are okay to do that. It wasn't so. We were oh, everybody was like, oh, do we have to, right? And then they say, okay, I'm kind of glad that you right, came along. It was not this I, Im impression that I'm gonna just always look at the field from afar and then sort of would say, okay, this is not right, this is not good, and place my judgment or as you be, to even go into the community and to talk to the women to so sort of be um, maybe, you know, judgmental or even to sort of uh, be standoffish or whatever, right? But I was, you know, in there and so it's really, it was also, I guess, my realization of what 
whether you are cut out for something like that, right, in that sense. And I want to add the other part of it is that, so you're present, you can be present in the field at certain times, right? Mm -hmm. but, but when you own the field, in terms of not owning the field, but you own, you take ownership of your relationship with the field. Even when you're not in the field, you're in the field. You know, because uh, uh, your access, your joy, your exhilaration is not here. Mm -hmm. Right? Your solidarity is not here. Yeah. Like, uh, my solidarity with each other, it is here, but it is not really here. Our relationship is borne out through our relationship in the field. You see, so, so in that sense, you come to inhabit the field much more so spatially rather than just physically. Right, right. Do you feel that? What, that the field is always with you? <laughs> yeah, in some way, you know. You carry some sand from the field in your pocket all the time. Yeah. <laughs> right? But, but it in terms of concepts, right? right? It changes you every time and you learn something and then you become, I don't know, you allow, I think it's not, that's the difference in CC and why I, I myself, right, engage in CC project. It's not because you know one's twisting my arm in the back or by any means. It's just the idea that I, I grow each time, I change each time, I see a different perspective, and I, I, you, I have that right. So it's that sense I think that keeps me going and kind of using that. Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the ability to Hello, hi. also allow yourself to go and learn every time. Right. No, 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 you're good. Go for it, come. Okay, thank you. See you later. Great. Do you need to go each time soon? Yes. What time is your thing? Thank you so much for yeah, coming. Thanks a lot, Yeah, hopefully. Yeah.